Welcome to our first lecture of our online lecture series Radar in Action in 2021. My name is Jens Fiege and I'm glad to have you back. I apologize first for my haircut, but uh, due to the Corona uh, lockdown in Germany, all hairdressers have been closed since mid-December, uh, but we're very optimistic that they will re reopen in March. Um, and these are not just the only corona restrictions here with us in Germany and of course still in many other countries. Home office is still the order of the day. Therefore, we would like to show you again in the next week and the next months virtually and completely harmless new from the radar world. Today, we start with the topic high resolution 20, uh, 240 gigahertz radar with silicon germanium chips. Prof Professor Niels Pohl, we first show the min miniaturization of semiconductors has also led to a miniaturization of radars, resulting in completely new applications. Afterwards, Dr. Reinhold Herschel will show examples of high resolution radar images from the laboratory at our institute. And now I will hand over to my colleague Niels Pohl, who will speak to you live from home. So welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to show you our latest research on integrated radar sensors. Um, yeah, so let's start. If, if we look at electronics, all started with a, a pioneer situation in the 1960s with the invention of the transistor. And Gordon Moore was one of the first guys who noted that the complexity of such electronics is really increasing in an um, exponential way. Um, that was a situation in 1965. He predicted that these increase uh, exponential growth will continue and it's still um, continuing, but it's mainly, uh, let's say, infecting, affecting digital circuits where you need really this uh, complexity. But he made also more predictions in this uh, very famous article. The last paragraph were also dedicated to microwave and electronics. So he um, made the prediction that even in the microwave area, integrated electronics will become increasingly important. So, but it was not possible to make a simple prediction. He just predicted that it is difficult to predict at the present time um, the, how, uh, yeah, the, the details, let's say there's no Moore's law for microwave electronics, but he already predicted that this could completely revolutionize radar. And that is what we see in the last, let's say, 10 years, that's re this revolution. And I want to show you some uh, steps of this revolution. So. First of all, why um, does the complexity help how, uh, uh, for, for uh, high frequencies? And the point is, for high complexity, you need to shrink down the transistor and uh, smaller transistors are faster. And here you see uh, five decades of tra um, transistor speed measured in two ways in the switching speed, the gate delay and the cutoff frequency. So um, it's inverse proportional to each other. The um, In the last, yeah, more, uh, six decades, the um, gate delay dropped down in a logarithmic way uh, according to Moore's law from one um, nanosecond to about one picosecond right now. And at the same time, the switching speed increased and will hopefully touch the one terahertz in the near future. So, but these are just technical numbers and you want, may ask, how does it impact me? And the point is the transistor needs a specific speed to fulfill the requirements in a specific application. And that is what we see in the 1990s, that the transistors were fast enough to make mobile phones. Compact mobile phones, because the full transceiver could be integrated on a single chip a long time ago, but that was a mobile phone revolution. And in the last uh, decade, we saw um, that automotive radar was the first mass market ever for radar sensors. And now I think almost every car has a radar sensor to uh, watch the road. And especially for autonomous driving, this number of sensors will uh, also increase. A lot of sensors are needed around the car. So that is really a key technology for our mobility of the future. So, but 
for in our research, we may ask what is next? So if we look into terahertz or higher gigahertz frequencies, what will be the next big step, the next revolution? And to be honest, I do not have an answer, but we try to look at these high frequency to see what's possible for the next future. So further looking into the past, if we uh, look like 10 years or 15 years in the past, radars looked like this, a lot of single components, um, split block components uh, mounted together, very costly uh, split block um, yeah, applications. And these sensors are not really suited for industrial application or consumer applications. They are uh, by far too expensive. But nowadays, the same functionality can be integrated on a single chip and solves a lot of problems um, you may have in sensor application. So one of the first single chip radars already came up in 1990s. So at the end of the 1990s, a fully integrated 94 gigahertz radar sensor um, realized in gallium arsenide by our colleagues in uh, Freiburg. Um, and that, uh, yeah, together with them, we made a product out of it uh, to do the uh, a radar sensor um, operating in um, aviation industry um, based on these. So, of course, it was a big step, but nowadays, if we look back, it looks a bit um, old fashioned, a free running oscillator in that sense, um, very noisy signal source. So that's not really suitable for high precision ranging or imaging. So nowadays we worked a lot on, on radar sending at um, higher uh, at, at 80 gigahertz at these frequencies. So this is an example and I can also show it in the camera how handy a uh, nice radar sensor can be. So we have made a demonstrator with a silicon germanium chip uh, mounted this on a standard uh, millimeter wave board uh, stabilized with some other electronic components and then into a standard housing with a USB interface. So that is one of our working ho horses in research to um, use that sensor for um, whatever kind of radar application you need. So the um, that is an ultra wideband 80 gigahertz radar sensor with a simple and flexible USB connection and all the signal processing can then be done on um, on a PC. So that's very flexible solutions for research. But that's what we already published almost 10 years ago. Um, and in the meantime, we were able to increase the frequencies to much higher uh, value. So, but if we look at higher frequencies, I already showed you the transistor speed itself increased over time by Moore's law. So that was uh, a lucky exit, uh, yeah, lucky incidents. But um, the interfaces to the outer wall, they do not scale in that sense. If we look and the technology how to contact a chip, then uh, we are, it was optimized in the last year so that the chip is placed in the small cavity to have small bond wires uh, to have a um, advanced bond matching technique. So these bond wires are just uh, have a length of 200 micrometers. So that's very short ones. But even those bond wires um, have an, a pet capacitance and a bond inductance of 100. The bond inductance is 150 picohenry. And if we look the, at these at 80 gigahertz, that gives a reactance of 75 ohm. Um, which is already a problem, but if we look at higher frequencies of 240 gigahertz, for example, uh, these um, inductance, uh, yeah, it triples in that sense by the tripling of the frequency. The lower values at 80 gigahertz, their broadband matching is possible, but with a higher values at um, 240 gigahertz, we do not think that the broadband matching of these bond wires is possible anymore due to these, um, yeah, big capacitance and big inductance um, that fully disturbs our signal um, interface. So at that point, we can say uh, we could stop the full research and say, um, yeah, chip interfaces do not work above 100 gigahertz, but that's not the full uh, truth. So on the other hand, antennas get smaller and smaller by the higher frequency. So at 240 gigahertz, it's even possible to integrate the full antenna on chip. Um, here, for example, a patch antenna with a size of 300 times 300 micrometers. So it's um, uh, roughly, so it's not a really big thing on a chip. Um, it's a differential patch. Here we um, have to handle the thin um, on-chip layer. So the distance from the patch to ground is less than 10 micrometers. 
in an ideal situation, we would uh, uh, realize it with a quarter wavelength that is much smaller. So that leads to a narrow band behavior, which we see here in the right. So um, that is fewer, uh, a pure adaption for white band operation. However, we still proceeded with this uh, and build it a, a white band radar sensor around it. We used um, sub um, harmonic um, signal generation, uh, an oscillator at 120 gigahertz, a frequency doubler, and then the bisetic operation with one transmit and one receive antenna on chip. And um, then all the millimeter wave interfaces are covered on chip, and we do not need any transition to the outer world at millimeter waves anymore. So that's really a big point. Um, especially if you know that um, the interfaces are typically um, a very costly solution and can be can cost much more than the chip fabrication itself. So that is a really um, good way to go to low cost systems if you integrate all the millimeter waves on chip. So you can place such a chip in a standard package with an open cavity to uh, radiate into outer space and then replace um, lens antenna above it, which also do the encapsulation of the chip. So it's housed safely in the antenna uh, and can radiate um, in the antenna and then the, foc the, the lens uh, focuses the beam in a certain direction. Um, then we connect the standard backend board with all the uh, low frequency electronics for the interfaces for a microcontroller and so on. So, and again, we realized um, demonstrator out of it and here we can achieve up to 25 gigahertz of modulation bandwidth, um, which seems a bit crazy because I already showed you that the antenna has a very narrow band behavior, and I will show you this impact uh, later on. So quite a compact thing. You can use that in several measurements, um, but if you look at the radiated output power, then you see these um, um, narrow band behavior. So, around the center frequency here at 230 gigahertz, 240 gigahertz, we have quite a, a bit of output power around zero dBm, which is sufficient for, let's say, indoor scenarios with several meters. Um, but the output power drops a lot if you go to lower frequencies. So here's also the measurement equipment uh, operated out of spec. So um, maybe the drop is less than here measured, but it we see a lot of uh, frequency dependency in the measurement results. And um, so the problem is a heavy amplitude response of the IF signal due to the narrow band matching of the antenna. Um, this is caused by, uh, and this decreases all our range resolution um, and uh, the measurement do not really look good with it. We will see that on the next slide um, with a, uncalibrated measurements, the red curve, the standard measurements, the resolution is, uh, pu uh, is pure, much purer than, poorer than we can expect. But all these um, the behavior is very reproducible, so we can compensate it. So we use the calibration technique, and then finally we see here in that setup, we place two targets which are with 3.2 millimeters distance to each other, and we can now clearly resolve both targets due to the extreme high bandwidth of 52 gigahertz. So um, even if the antenna is narrow band, we can compensate this in the signal processing, and we get very close to the theoretical limit of that accuracy. And then this uh, that was resolution. And finally, we see that also a high, very high accuracy is possible. So first of all, the measurement gives us a raw accuracy around, uh, yeah, let's say, if we, we uh, distance accuracy, no, it's after calibration, of course, we see less than plus minus five micrometers, micrometers and in a short range, the, it's even better than plus minus 0 0.5 micrometers if we just uh, shift by one centimeters in that sense. So that's really a very accurate distance sensor, um, which comes in the, um, yeah, which is close to that was uh, better sensors, much more expensive sensors can do. But there are other problems of the hardware we have to um, compensate and suppress in signal processing. Um, we see due to the subharmonic signal generation, um, here, there's a wanted target at a, um, here in that sense, 0 0.5 meter distance, 
That is the targets we place there really at 0.5 meter distance. What we always see additionally is a false target at half the distance, and this is due to the um, fundamental feed-through of the transmit and receive path, so also the signal at 120 gigahertz gets uh, radiated and received back, so that gives a lot of um, yeah, false targets in the scene, and that is not easy to compensate that in signal processing, so we further went in the lab and um, realized um, uh, suppression in, let's say, in hardware, a dielectric filter, which suppresses the fundamental um, feed-through, but um, the, the double signal um, yeah, can penetrate through it because it's in phase and the fundamental signal is out of phase after this um, dielectric filter. So that in the, now in the measurement, you see that in the blue curve, there is a false target and with the red curve, there is no false target anymore. So we see that even if the electronics at these um, very high frequencies are not behaving perfect. You do not have perfect isolation, um, but um, yeah, um, here we see that um, this can be compensated by uh, a housing um, with these dielectric filter. So um, the all these hardware effects can be uh, compensated to the reality. So that's now the situation that we can start imaging. And that's the point where I want to hand over to Reinhold Herschelt, who is our expert for imaging and signal processing. Yeah. Thanks, Niels, um, for giving this uh, presentation on the technology and giving me the chance to go from the technology now to the system and, of course, the image level. We've seen great signals, uh, so we have seen accuracies in the hundreds of nanometers, which is uh, highly impressive. And let's go a step further. Um, if we take many measurements together, you can even go in the, uh, into imaging. So we can basically take thousands of measurements, all combine them coherently and get uh, images out of it as we would be used uh, from, uh, from a camera. Uh, as you see here, uh, for example, a guitar, um, in this image, uh, you see not only the surface of a guitar, I mean, we all recognize the shape, it's, it's, it's quasi optic because the frequency is so high that we are in millimeter resolution, but we can still see through the object. You can see uh, in the construction, we can see, we could see the facts which gives us the possibility for non destructive testing. Another question is looking through luggage. So we can see metal objects, we can see suspicious, uh, suspicious um, threads in luggage without taking x-ray. So we are, we are preventing harm, but we are not harming anyone. Um, the same is true for looking in uh, construction. So we look layer by layer through um, constructed materials, as you see here, a fiberglass multi-layer material, like an x-ray, we can look through, but without the ionizing radiation, which we, um, which we know from x-rays. The same, of course, can be also done in more dimensions. So you can encirculate an object uh, and, and reconstruct the outer shape, as you see here in this, uh, this object, which yeah, looks a bit more familiar in Christmas time. I think it's, yeah, as far as I remember, it's a uh, chocolate um, snowman. Uh, and we just reconstructed the entire surface uh, using the high accuracy of a sensor. Uh, also, for seeing threats on people, that gives you a quasi-optic image, but you don't only see things, you see through things, which is uh, a huge charm for many applications. How does it actually work? As I said, we don't only need a single sensor where we get exactly the resolution and the accuracy uh, Niels just presented this, we need many of them. And if you um, would do that in optics, you would use a lens, and this lens would give you the possibility to focus at a certain point. Um, you can do the same thing in a radar. The lens is basically uh, delaying the ray more or less, depending on the thickness of a glass. The same you can do digitally. So each element is delaying the signal digitally. So you measure, uh, you delay, and you sum. And by doing that, your lens can focus anywhere. It can focus anywhere in, uh, in front of you. So point by point sampling over the entire image. This resolution, um, the resolution of that is first of all given by the bandwidth. You just remember the 
amazing 52 gigahertz Niels presented for his trip. Uh, and on the other hand, on the center wavelength, which gives you not the distance resolution, which is given by the bandwidth, but the so-called cross-range resolution, which is basically the resolution in front of the imager. And uh, the fundamental limit is quarter of a wavelength. Um, if you calculate the wavelength for 300 gigahertz signal, you end up at about a millimeter. So 300 gigahertz would allow us to go into 250 microns uh, resolution, theoretically. The other scaling factor is the size of the array. So the larger the array, the better the focus. If infinite sensor would be lambda by four, and if it's finite, it depends on the size. The smaller the sensor, the higher the frequency has to be for high resolution. And this is exactly why we need millimeter waves. Um, the question would be, okay, why can't we make images at 15 gigahertz? Of course we can. Um, as you see here for metal plate, we typically take these kind of metal plates, uh, piece, uh, cut it PCBs for evaluating our systems. You see an image of 15 gigahertz and, and you see basically the shapes of, of on the plate, but you don't really see the image part, which is this star here, for example. So as you would see here in this image, this cannot be resolved at 15 gigahertz. Uh, why can it not be resolved at 15 gigahertz? Because lambda by four is somewhere in the centimeter range. And the higher we go in frequency, if we go to 15, 30 gigahertz, 60 gigahertz, or 240, the more we tend towards the camera. Just remember, a camera works in optics, so in a uh, hundreds of nanometers wavelength. And here we are working in the millimeter wave region, so the resolution is not as good as the camera, but we get almost as good as the camera on resolution, and we can look through, through things, which is, of course, a huge advantage compared to optics. From an application point of view, of course, you could we basically can look for everything which is not conductive. We can brilliantly see metal surfaces, but we cannot see um, true metal. Uh, but if you think of any yeah, dielectric material, like a fiber uh, glass uh, material, composite material, we can see through that. And we can see layer by layer, we can see the structure in it. So you can correct errors in the structure before you actually build your parts, like a windmill, for example. And here we clearly see, of course, the structure at 80 gigahertz, we can see it, we can think we can see it, but if you compare it on the right side of a 240 gigahertz image, you see that's just another leak. You see it fiber by fiber. And so we can use it in non-destructive testing. We can do scans, we can uh, in 3D reconstruct uh, images and use that uh, for looking into material science. But of course, we can also use it for other applications. Um, like, for example, here, an application you might be aware of. If um, some people might remember, in former times, we were flying from country to country. Uh, and if you did that at the airport, you were checked. You were not checked by an X-ray scanner, by a, by a radar scanner. So you go there, you raise your arms, and then you're scanned this or another way. This scan takes one, two, three seconds, and then an image is processed. If you're on the millimeter wave range, uh, the image has a high resolution versus an image uh, from, a, uh, from a scanner, which is just here behind me. Um, in the microwave range, this image has worse resolution, but you can easily see through winter jackets, for example. Well, it's, it's an open question what is better, but it really depends what you want to see. And if you go further down in the microwave range, the good thing is the resolution is coarse. Of course, we almost don't see the person, but if a threat is huge, like a gun, for example, you can even make a video stream because you have less data, you have less to process, you can use it in speed. And we can just have a closer look um, in such a system here behind me. Um, this, um, this is an imaging system which is not a scanner. Um, so where we made the high resolution images and we were measuring point by point, but can take some time depending on the resolution you want to achieve. And if you want to be quicker, you have to measure you have to parallelize. You have to measure in parallel. So you take many channels, many transmitters, and many receivers, which are all represented here by one antenna element. They are par in parallel measuring, and then you combine the entire image, uh, the entire data to an image. All these cables here behind are there to synchronize all sensors and to make all channels as, as good as the characteristics that Niels just showed us. 
Um, in this case, we are on the microwave range, so it's less data, and we can invest it in some pre-processing. Here in this board, for example, you have two chips, and these chips are already pre-processing the data, so you get images out instead of just getting the radar signal out. Um, this is a lower resolution, uh, it gets lower resolution image, but it, of course, has a different interface. It has a USB interface already, so the integration of a system is far higher. So our scientific aim is to drive this kind of integration to higher frequencies, to go to 80 gigahertz, to go to 240 gigahertz, to make scanners at higher frequencies to millimeter waves as elegant as these scanners here, yeah, in order to make them cheap, in order to use them for many applications, um, yeah, and in order to solve problems, because that's what we are doing in Fraunhofer. Thank you very much, and I guess Niels and me are looking forward to your questions and to help you with the technology questions you might have on radar. Thank you. Thank you, Boos, for your interesting presentations. Um, I do not want to waste time. There are many questions. Um, the first question is, is there um, any other permitted frequency band beside the ESM band with only two gigahertz bandwidth? It's for NIRTS. I have to unmute, of course. So here I am. Um, that's a good question. So of course there is the ISM band which gives you uh, two gigahertz. That's a good situation. Um, additionally, there is no, let's say, standard frequency band, but a lot of frequency regulations for these higher bands are uh, ongoing, at least in Europe, for industrial applications. And we hope to have uh, a wider use, allowed usage in the future. Thank you, Niels. Um, here's the next question uh, again for Niels. What did you mean by the revolution in automotive radar in 2014? The first mass production radar in cars was already in 1999 by Conti, for example. Yeah, of course. I yeah, I do not want to hide that. Uh, there was, of course, a lot of history besides um, this. I, I just pointed the point where I saw that uh, it was really a mass market. So uh, I think uh, more than half of the cars had a radar sensor during that time. And if you look back in 1999, it just was maybe hundreds of cars. So that was a niche technology during that time, uh, very expensive. And then due to the silicon integration, it became affordable and went into every car. So of course, there's no uh, exact point of time where the revolution started, but I would say some, uh, somewhere around um, 2014. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is for Reinhold. How did you perform the calibrations for the range resolution, just in the signal processing or by hardware configuration adjustment? Um, basically, both is true. Um, of course, we need some data where we uh, where we signal processing can be based on. Um, what you try is to get a measurement where you know how it should theoretically look like. That can be uh, a point reflector. So if I could wish for something, I would have a perfect point reflector reflecting all the energy. Um, since that is hard to realize, we either take um, a corner reflector, which is far away from the radar, which is a point source kind of, or we take a huge metal plate where we cover the entire imager, uh, like you would cover the entire imaging system here with a metal plate. And so I know exactly where the reflection should be. I know the path length, I know that it behaves for all frequencies is the same. And basically from the difference or from yeah, the, uh, yeah, from the difference of a measured signal um, to my expected signal, I can now see, okay, what is the effect of the object, which I know, and what's the effect of the system I want to characterize. And if you do that for each transmitter receiver combination, you can calibrate for that. And the system does not behave on the object. So you can always compensate for the system behavior and compensate uh, and make the full uh, use of the bandwidth for the in, uh, for each object you want to measure. Of course, you have to be aware if you don't measure somewhere, you cannot calibrate that out. You cannot invent signal. Uh, but everything uh, which is due to a fluctuation of a signal due to the characteristic of a sensor, this can be calibrated. Uh, okay, thanks. Here's the next question. Uh, the resolution due to 25 gigahertz bandwidth is very fine. How 
to get the cross range resolution or Doppler res resolution. Okay. Is that for Reinhold? I was just going to take it. I guess both of us could, could answer. Um, the range resolution is given by the, um, by the huge bandwidth. Okay, uh, this, uh, this was the starting point of the question. The cross range resolution instead is given on the bandwidth of the angular spectrum, to say it in a more theoretical way. So uh, basically by the aperture size, the larger your, um, your larger system is, uh, the more uh, for a single transmitter antenna, you don't have a uh, transmitter receiver uh, combination. You don't have any angular resolution, no cross range resolution. You just have range resolution. If you t and the more antennas you take, the larger the aperture, the more precise you get to cross range resolution. So for an infinitely large aperture, like you would go one centimeter in front of this imager, for example, you would get close to lambda by four which uh, in this specific case would be so something like a millimeter. Um, and the smaller it gets, the smaller this uh, the course of this resolution gets. So for a single module, for example, you would probably end up at five millimeters, six millimeters, um, something like this. So the cross range resolution is the size of a system compared to the center wavelength, while the range resolution uh, is given by the bandwidth. The Doppler resolution instead um, is given by the measurement time. So the Doppler is the change of phase over time. So if you're standing in front of a radar and you're moving, uh, the phase of the signal uh, is changing um, since you're moving towards or away from the wave. Um, and if you if the phase is changing, we can think of its change rate as a frequency, and this is called the Doppler frequency. And the longer you look at the Doppler or the frequency, the more precise you can measure it. So this is given by the measurement time in total. Yeah, thank you, Reinhold. We have many questions. Um, if you filter certain power peaks away, you lose either T, TX or RX energy. How you compensate this? What is the power consumption of a shown 240 gigahertz sensor? Who will answer it shortly? I will do so. <laughs> so, um, shortly. <laughs> Uh, the, the power consumption, I had it on the slide, is 3 watt, I guess. Um, so most of that is for the standard electronics, for the PLL, uh, not for the chip itself. The chip is uh, half a watt, I would guess. So um, we filter out, we do not filter out power peaks. We calibrate that as, as explained by Reinhold. So it does not, we do not throw uh, transmit power away in that sense, to answer it shortly. Great. Um, dear Professor Niels Pohl, uh, from your uh, your presentation, your radar transceiver is a fixed beam, if I understand correctly. Do you think with single fixed beam it is sufficient for the application? If it's not, are you using mechanical steering in the current work? So uh, I guess half of the qu uh, uh, question is already answered by um, Reinhold's presentation. So the sensor itself, the, what I presented here, is fixed beam in a certain in specific direction. That's um, helpful for, for simple ranging applications, but not for imaging applications. So um, of course, we have several solutions for that. We use that sensor in a moving scenario for SAR measurements. We already have ongoing projects for um, MIMO um, architectures to um, have a um, steerable beam, electronic steerable beam. Thank you. Um, next question. Do you think that frequency beyond 300 gigahertz would be possible by RF components? <laughs> That's a good question. So we are looking at this in our current research. Um, we already did integrated circuits at 300 gigahertz and first experiment at 400 gigahertz. We are an ongoing uh, technology development project together with IHP and Infineon. And as the transistor speeds improve, um, it's also the electronics will improve. So, and antenna integration gets easier and easier if we go to higher frequencies. So, uh, there's a lot of factors which help us if um, the scaling continues. Okay, next question. For terahertz imaging, any possibilities to be used for medical imaging applications? I, I know. I guess I can take over here. Um, Shortly. Sure, there are 
there are applications uh, for medical as well. Um, for example, uh, looking at uh, looking at skin. Um, I think we did experiments a few years ago already uh, looking at uh, skin cancer uh, and, and we've seen artifacts because you can look into the skin um, like you might some people might know it from OCT optical coherence tomography uh, looking into the skin we can even look deeper into that um, in a millimeter wave or microwave imaging uh, there are systems I know it from an Israel company they are looking uh, for breast cancer um, and consider that to be far cheaper um, than current systems. Uh, so they think of yeah, um, supporting the third world where with, with sensors they can achieve to, to save lives also in countries who don't have a, a medical system as we have. And um, for imaging uh, applications where yeah, basically everything you could look at, I think we looked at, um, we looked through uh, bandages. Uh, so if you broke your arm, you can have a look, okay, do we have to change the bandage or not? Since we can look through it. So every everywhere where you want to look through things, uh, you can also look into the medical sector. It's kind of a non-destructive testing as well, isn't it? At least I don't want to be distracted in that application. Okay, great. You have so many questions. Considering a huge radar aperture like the Tyra surface, what would be the maximum possible distance between the radar and the object to get a clear radar picture of a moving target? Hmm. That is a crazy question. <laughs> Interesting. So, um, if uh, TIRA is a very big aperture, but it's operating at much lower frequencies. So, if you consider the wavelengths, our sensor uh, aperture is not so much smaller. So, let's take like that. Um, of course, with such a uh, large uh, aperture, we could, uh, would get a beam which is so narrow that it would be very interesting to do imaging with it. Okay, so someone asked to obtain a demonstrator for research purposes. We will contact uh, or please write us an email for this. Um, and the next question, is it possible to exploit this uh, Siege ship in ZAR applications? For example, in small satellite LEO for high resolution image. I think, I think I can take over here. Um, we actually do that. Um, not for this application, but we do SAR. Um, all the scan images you've seen are practically SAR applications. I mean, I move a sensor in the scanner um, and fuse that. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a satellite or my mechanical scanner, so to say. Um, the point is, in this case, you need to know your movement. And you need to know your movement by an accuracy of a fraction of a wavelength, typically lambda by 10 or lambda by 5. Um, if we consider that uh, 300 gigahertz has one millimeter wavelength. You would need your, to know your trajectory by 250 microns or 300. Depends a bit on the antenna design. If you can make sure that this is the case, I'm sure it's possible. That's more an accuracy question. So if you want to have a high resolution image, you need a high ac accuracy imager. Um, it's not that much of radar technology which would limit you here. It's more your mechanical accuracy. But yeah, if someone is able to do it, and provide that, we are happy to support that. Would be an amazing research, wouldn't it? Okay, so the time is very late. So I will answer, we will answer one question. If your question is not answered, you can write an email to um, me, to Reinhold or to Niels Pohl, then we will answer it later on. Here the last question. Um, about the impressive imaging results. However, the results are achieved under being conditions. What about automotive applications under adverse weather conditions, safety aspects, etc.? I guess I can take over here as well. For bad weather, we have a clear advantage um, compared to, to uh, leader images or to optical cameras. There is always a discussion between the radar community um, and the uh, camera community, uh, what, is, what is actually better because you get high resolution images by a very cheap sensor using a radar. Uh, I know that Elon Musk look, thinks that way. He doesn't use radar in his Tesla. I'm not sure if it's a good decision. Uh, let's see. Um, but um, with a radar sensor, you can look through rain, you can look through fog. That is far more tolerant. Uh, we look from robots in completely burning houses with, uh, 
the project was called Smokebot. The leader didn't see anything at all. The radar has seen through closed fog, so uh, basically real black fog in there. Um, so that's uh, far less um, sensible, uh, sensitive to environmental conditions than any other um, imaging technology you could think of. The point is you need to compensate for the movement, especially if you think of Doppler. In this case, you have to think of measures how to measure the movement. Uh, but uh, if you know the movement, if I know where my sensor is over time, the images could be as impressing as I've shown. Oh, thanks, Reinhold. Thanks, Neil. Thank, uh, thank you a lot for your participation. Thank you for your attention, for taking time to our presentations. Um, tomorrow morning you will receive a small survey about how you like the presentations. We would be happy if you take a few minutes and answer it. And on Friday you will receive the presentation slides of today's lectures. Finally, for today, I would like to point out the next presentations. Next week, we will show how to use passive radar to control the night marking of wind turbines. If you haven't registered yet, you can, call, of course, still do so. So we will see you next week or next time. Goodbye.